we're going to reap because our God doesn't take away things. It's not our God. He takes away sickness and disease. He takes away poverty and lack, but he doesn't take blessings and precious people out of our lives. He just helps us sow them so that we get to reap a hundredfold. I'm expecting a hundred Amandas. We need a hundred Amandas at Beloved Church. Some of them can be taller. All right, you go. Okay. Hi, family. Thanks for taking the time to hear what I guess I think I have to say. Although being the last person to speak, um, my little mini sermon is kind of already hijacked. So <laughs> thanks to Pastor Ryan, Pastor Steve, Pastor Dennis, Cherie, who have also said things that were on my heart to share today. So, yeah, well, of course, you know, Holy Spirit always does that. So I am going to the nation of Thailand, which is on my shirt here that we had made. So thanks for people who are representing them. I do have a few left, three of them. Maybe they're your size. So <coughs> I am going, if this is the country right here, it's supposed to be an O. See, it says love. That's the mission, love. So this is Thailand, and then I will be, like, right here at the top, um, and then Burma is over here. So it's like a mountainous rural region of the country, which is pretty cool. Um, so I guess what I think I would still want to encourage you with today is what's already been mentioned, that everyone here is a missionary in your own mission field, whether it's internationally or just within your neighborhood. So um, I think one of the most important things, which is one of, I think, my main targets in spending time at Faith Village, which is the orphanage that I'll be at, is imparting to people, helping them to realize um, their worth and identity in Christ. So I think to be an effective missionary, you have to know what you carry, which one of the greatest things that was already mentioned is love, that you have the love of Jesus that you can share, but also to know um, your identity and specific giftings in order um, to effectively minister to people and what can, you can bring to them. So I might call a couple people out here. Um, so one of the things that people keep mentioning to me when I tell them about what I'm doing, um, they're like, you're brave. I couldn't do that. I'm like, you know what, that's perfectly okay because you're not designed to do that. I am. I have the grace to do it because this is it's my call. Um, so, th so there's just a natural flow to it. So each of you, I desire for you to know what God has in store for you and to seek it out. So I'm going to call out my mama. That's my mama. <laughs> So my mom has an incredible gift for quality time. She's not going to be one of those people that comes to see you and she's like on her phone, which she wouldn't be because she doesn't have a smartphone. <laughs> but uh, she, she loves to spend time with people, and that's an incredible gift that she has that I know she can um, flow in to a greater extent and minister to people's hearts. And Boone, you are also on my heart. Um, yesterday I had a picture of you ministering love and healing to sick kids in the hospital because you carry a lot of joy and you there's a lot of opportunities for you to release it. So also I feel like part of going away internationally to be a missionary for me is knowing that I need to change, that I need to see things differently. And so I'm totally expecting to be able to um, impart and release what I have to other people, but also know that I'm going to be changed. Stop it, Cindy. <laughs> that I'm going to be changed tremendously. So a few things um, that I have written down that I know um, I need to do better is that I need to see God bigger 
in my life and trust him for greater things and to let him just do what he does and not try and do it myself. I need to love people better, like Shri already says, do loving well. Um, and to understand people who aren't like me, which the culture all the way across the globe is totally different. I know I need to honor people more. And you've probably heard Brian Greenwood when he comes and speaks about this, but <coughs> their system is totally different socially, that they're still um, operating under a monarchy, and that kind of trickles down to the way that I guess they see authorities in their life. And I think that's something that I can learn from, because like when we were in the villages before, when we went last year in April, like we'd, we went into a marketplace and just wanted to like chat with people and invite them to um, the church service that we were going to. And we kind of got stopped, and they were like, yeah, you need to speak with our um, village guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like the mayor type person. So you need to make sure it's okay that you can talk with people. And it was because he knew the pastor of the church we were, we were going to, but it's just like that system of honoring people and asking for permission is something that I think we're very lacking here in America, especially people in my generation. So I know I have a lot to learn from them. So another one of my missions, also because I'm going to an orphanage, has been on my heart for many years um, to love kids who don't have parents or have parents who have failed them. And so in part of that, and calling out their identity, that I want to come alongside the leadership there and do what they're already doing in that. And I wanted to let you know, like, I think it's really cool that the ladies' ministry, I guess this is a plug, that they're doing a study on Esther Saturday mornings twice a month. And Esther's, like, one of my gals. Um, she really... <laughs> inspires me because she was an orphan and she had the boldness um, and favor to petition the king to save her people. And so I guess I can really relate to that because I feel like I'm being like her and that I'm willing to step out boldly because I know that I are already have the favor of God. Like I don't need to go ask it from somebody. So I'm so thankful for that. Um, there are a couple verses I want to share with you, and I, I didn't let you know beforehand, so I can just read them so you know what they are. <laughs> um, so the first one is 1 Corinthians 3, 8 through 9, and it says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, and you are God's building. So that's something I put in my support letter that I sent out just to inspire everyone that, like, this is what I'm doing, but each of you have your own um, position to plant or water, to sow seeds, whoever you are. So the second one is 1 Samuel 30, 24. It says, actually, if you could look that up, Duck, that would be kind of cool because I want to see it in the King James I partially wanted to look it up because the verbiage makes me laugh. So it says, <laughs> <laughs> For who will hearken unto you in this matter, but as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. So in case you didn't understand what that meant, it's... <laughs> It says, I think it was in the ESV, who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. So those who are going into battle, or those who are staying, still receive the same reward. So if you're feeling like you're looking at other people or looking at me or Sheree or other Pastor Steve who's constantly like out doing other things and um, talking to government officials and all this stuff. 
if you feel like that's like you're not living up to it because that seems bigger, that's a lie. But just please seek out from God what he wants you to do each and every day. It may very well be mowing widow's lawns, and that could change a whole town. And that's basically, like, all I have to say. Just be you and press into Jesus and just walk with him every day. And thanks for walking with me. After all that, can't wait to get rid of you. Amen. Our, our family, this is a sidebar, our family is going to go on a family mission trip this year. Uh, neither of my children nor my wife has left the country in Jesus' name. So I'm taking them because Hannah's a senior this year, and so she's going to graduate and go on and do her stuff. What is wrong with me? So anyway, we're going to do a family mission trip, and we're going to go to Thailand. I was trying to coincide it while Amanda was there, but um, she's not tough enough to stay long enough. So we're <laughs> no, she only she's only allowed exactly ninety days by her visa. Otherwise, they come and I don't know do what to you, but they do something mean. <clears throat> so anyway, she's going to leave before we get gone. So there's a lot of mission opportunities for you. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because I would like for someone, we're going to have some interaction time now, for someone to tell me what this is. You would think that this is a chair, but you would only be partially correct. Duckling, I think you have a video. Okay. This is your cousin. This is your hairstylist. This, this is, is the co-worker, co-worker that you that pass, you pass in, the in the hall every day. day. It's, your, it's doctor, your doctor, your babysitter, your, babysitter, your, your best, best friend. friend. This, this is the neighbor down the street, street that you've never spoken to. to. This, this is a chair. chair. And right, and right now, now, it's empty. It's empty. But, but someone, someone you know could have a life-changing, life-changing experience, experience just, just by sitting there. there. Have you have talked to them? Invite, invite someone, someone to, church to church this week. week. You, you never, never know. know. It, it, it might, might just, just be the moment, moment they've been waiting for. Has anyone had a life-changing experience with Jesus? Man, am I, am I at church today? Is there anybody in this building that is listening to me that has had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ? How selfish of you to keep that to yourself. This, this chair represents that person that is currently in the hopelessness, despair, and misery that you were in before Jesus. And the fact that it's empty is the sad part. There's... Uh, There's empty chairs in our sanctuary. There's empty pews in our balcony. It ought not to be. There are people that need to have an encounter as equal to yours or greater than yours with Jesus Christ that will not have that encounter, most likely without you. We would be foolish to think that we're just going to sit here as a church and Jesus Christ is going to, in some magical pixie dust way, going to just send people into the door and then we're just going to have them have an encounter. That's not the way the gospel works. Does anybody have a Bible? All right. I know know people are like, well, I don't really carry my Bible to church. Um, This is a good place to have your Bible, by the way. In Mark chapter 1, 
starting in verse 21. They, here is Jesus and Peter and Andrew, who were brothers, and James and John, who were brothers. All four of them were fishermen. It's amazing that Jesus, the first four people that he chose to be a part of his evangelistic association were fishermen. People who understood the concept of trying to get something out of the environment that is very familiar into an environment that it doesn't want to be in. That would be irony for fishing. Um, the church has adopted a fishing model today that goes something like this. They go down to the costume store. They buy a great big largemouth bass costume. They put it on and zip it up, and then they go jump in the lake, and they go swim over to a largemouth bass, and they say, hey, why don't you come to my church? And as you can probably think, the real largemouth bass is looking at the human version of a largemouth bass and doesn't swim anywhere close to it because it's freaked out. That's mostly the way that we try to fish today. The way you fish is, anybody ever fished? You put something really stinky on a hook and you attract the fish by its gut. In other words, what it needs. You don't become a fish to get a fish. This, this is not really what's been happening in the church today. In the church today, they tell us that we need to be more like the fish if we're going to attract fish. I would surmise to you that what the fish that are in this world really want is to not be a fish anymore. They weren't created to be a fish. So here's what I want to say. I want you to be okay with being a Christian who believes in morality and, and character. You believe in being filled with the Holy Ghost. You believe in signs, wonders, and miracles. You believe that Jesus Christ, who's the Son of God, was born of a virgin, lived an earthly life, died on a cross for the sins of all of mankind. It's not a fairy tale, and he's not Santa Claus. You believe that. You've had an encounter with him. It's that simple for you to minister the truth to someone that you know is just tell them about your encounter. I know, I don't know, probably at least 30 or 40 of your testimonies of those encounters that you have. And many of you can tell me your testimonies and it'll bring me and you both to tears. And I don't even need to be caught. And you'd catch me. You know, your family, your friends need to be caught. We're going to fill this building up four times every weekend. Wouldn't it be better for you to be sitting with a bunch of people that you know were once hopeless and in despair? that you had the opportunity to bring out of the darkness into the light. You know, you can own a row. I'll put tags on it. This is Ed's row. Everybody sitting here is from Ed. This is Wayne's row. This is Heather's row. I want you to be okay with the fact that Jesus doesn't want you to be a fish anymore. He wants you to be the one that's rescuing fish. Amen? You don't have to clean them up. Just bring them in here. We'll, we'll handle it from here. Amen? We'll disciple them. We'll plug them into groups. We'll, we'll knock the scales off them. Some of them. Some of them like them. We'll, we'll feed them. We'll cut them up if we need to. Amen? Anybody? 
They went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue. He is Jesus, and he taught. There's this concept that's been flowing through Christianity today that says that the church no longer has the importance that it once did. That it's just all about having a personal relationship with Jesus, and you can sit at the couch and watch Joel Osteen on TV, and you had church. I guess Jesus didn't know your doctrine. If there's anybody that was going to stop the whole going to church thing, it was the founder of the New Testament that we live in. Jesus went to church. The synagogue is a church, the local church. Because I know we say church, well, it's the universal church. We're all part of the universal church. Yes, we are. That would be, con that would be what we would relate to in the New Testament as the temple the one main place that everybody had to go once a year. But the synagogues were the local churches in each little individual town where the people of that individual town got together, did life together. They actually, in the synagogues in that day, they would actually have rooms where people could sleep if they were traveling. They would have meals. So if you'd stop by and you were hungry, you could be fed. They had... They had counselors there that would help you with life issues. They even had people that were there that if you had needs, that they would figure out how the community, the synagogue community, could help you with your needs. That sounds just like the local church and what it's supposed to be. And Jesus went there. You know, we have this, this belief that Jesus just floated around from mountain to mountain, from river to river, from dusty uh, desert place to dusty desert place. I will tell you that in my... Bible at home, I have annotated 14 different scriptures just in three of the Gospels that said that Jesus went to the synagogue, and Jesus went to the synagogue, and Jesus went to the synagogue. Jesus went to church. Did Jesus need church? I know you're probably, there. Oh, I don't know, I don't want to answer because I could be wrong. Jesus needed church. He didn't need it because he was lacking and he was insufficient in some way, but he needed to be where the Father told him to be. Now, if the Father told Jesus to be in church. All right, that went over, that went over well. Someone say, Jesus went to church. I'm like Jesus. <laughs> See, I got you there. And he taught. Amen. So I'm in good company. I get to teach at church. Next verse, please, duckling. And they, now there's the largest group of people in the Bible that you and I need to be aware of is the group called they. They were in very important places in all of the scriptures. They were always doing something. They were always the hinge pin between things not getting done and things getting done. They were always seemingly there when the miracles were happening, when, when lives were being changed, when God was doing really incredible stuff. They were always there. So who is they? in these particular scriptures. Now, what you're probably going to think is, well, Jesus and the disciples. Well, I thought that too. So I would always think like, you know, they, the ones that were doing stuff, was the disciples. But upon real legitimate discernment of the scriptures, because the Holy Ghost has to work with me special, not that I'm saying I'm special. Thank you. Amen. That's what my teachers used to say. <laughs> they, who? They that there were at the church. They at the church were astonished at his doctrine. Why was it astonishing for Jesus to come into the church and teach? Because he taught them as one that had authority. He taught them authority as a person that had authority. Now, here's a radical concept. The people in the church telling other people who are not in the church 
about the things that they have that they would like for the other people to have. This is why I'm adamant about the kingdom getting into the deep places of your life. It is hard for you to tell someone about the love of God when you've never experienced the love of God. It's hard for you to tell someone or give someone grace when you've never really received grace. It's hard for you to be merciful to people when you've never really experienced mercy. See, Jesus was someone that experienced the Father and experience the authority that came with him, knowing his identity. And then he came into the church, y'all, the church. He wasn't down at the bar. He wasn't at the brothel. He was at the church, and he was teaching them authority. Radical. So what do you think they all did? Well, they just totally embraced him, right? Next verse, please. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. I'm going to just drop this because I don't have time to go here. The first time of any recorded instance that Jesus Christ ran across a demon was right here. So let me say that. You, you can come back later. I can show you all the stuff, and we can go into the parallel Bibles and figure out through all the stuff. And I, I'll just tell you, just... I'll save you some trouble. This is the first time Jesus ever ran into a demon, and it was at church. Church is where Jesus found his first demon. In America, we just medicate them and still go to church. Well, they didn't have the medication, so when Jesus was teaching with authority, the demon said, ah! Amen. If you're in the room and you medicate your demons, next Sunday, come without the medication. Let's see what happens. Amen. See, I'm not looking at anybody. And the demon cried out. Next verse, please, Duckling, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou? How did this demon know this dude was from Nazareth? They're in Capernaum. Art thou come to destroy us? Does the demon know something that you and I might not know? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. Let me say this. This demon in this church knew who Jesus was more than anybody else in this church. <laughs> Amen. You know the devil knows who you are? You know the devil knows who you are so much that your name gives him shivers up and down his spine. You know, when you wake up in the morning, every demon in hell, and the devil himself goes, ah, oh, crap, I shouldn't say that. Oh, shoot. <laughs> They're awake again. You know what most Christians say? Oh, I hope the devil don't get me. You know what the devil's saying? Man, I hope that Christian will ever figure out who they are. The day that Christian figures out who they are, our toast is cooked. Amen. This, this right here proves that. This demon knew more about who Jesus was than anybody that he was ministering to. Now, I want you to stick with me. This is important. So the next verse, Jesus deals with this demon, tells him to shut up because Jesus wanted people to have a revelation of who he was through experience, not through a miraculous encounter, which... I'm not going to preach on that, but oftentimes we think that some miraculous encounter is going to make a person fall in love with Jesus. No, miraculous encounters are just the dinner bell that rings, that brings people to the table. The table is the intimacy that we experience with the Lord, and that's when we know who they are. So Jesus told them to shut up, verse 26, and then the unclean spirit, who was so entwined with the person, made the person not shut up, ran his mouth, but he left because Jesus told him to. If you've got any kind of oppression in your life, you know it's real simple. Amen. We don't have to do this whole thing and get in all kinds of trickery to try to figure out how to get oppression out of our lives. Jesus just took authority over him and he left. <laughs> Amen. I've read thick 
thick books on how to cast out demons. And Jesus did it in half a verse. <laughs> Amen. And they were all amazed <laughs> that this guy got set free at church. For real. They were all amazed that somebody went to church and got set free. Sounds like today. Insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, this thing that he does, what new doctrine is this? For what authority commands he even the unclean spirits? And they obey him. Keep going, Ducklin. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region round about Galilee. By whom? Hey, remember those people I was telling you about in the Bible? What's their name again? They. They. They went out and said, hey, there's this dude. <laughs> he is not like any other dude. You need to meet him. They weren't trained. They didn't go to Bible college. They didn't go to evangelistic sessions one, two, three, four, or five. They didn't get any kind of special equipping. They didn't get um, any kind of uh, special jewelry to wear to go and tell people about the incredible man that they just had an encounter with. They just went out. It was like it was natural. <laughs> what a concept. It was just natural for them to go and tell something to someone that was super exciting to them. Anybody have a favorite sports team? Oh, you guys are so holy. Nobody has a... <laughs> um, are you given... You are in church. You will act right. Does anybody have a favorite sports team? Do you talk about it? Mm -hmm. Do you wear their clothes? Do you buy their stuff? You know, oftentimes in America, we're way more committed to the Packers than we are to the Lord. All right. Pick your team. You know, it's natural for you to talk about, you know, if, you're, if your team won last night, you will probably tell someone tonight. Let me say this. Jesus is going to win in here tonight. <laughs> we'll see if Jesus is on your favorite team by who you talk about. Uh, amen. And forthwith, that's a good King James word. When they were come out of the synagogue, when they came out of the church, they entered into the house of Simon, Andrew, and James, and John. And so I'm going to fast forward here a little bit. They go into Simon's, which is Peter. They go into his mother-in-law's house, and his mama's sick. And so Jesus heals his mama, which, again, is one of the first miracles that these guys are experiencing with Jesus because they just seen their first demon. And then Peter gets his mother-in-law healed. And I've heard people say that's why Peter denied Jesus at the end of his life, because he healed his mother-in-law, but I don't think that's true, because <laughs> I love my mother-in-law. <laughs> I do. And at evening, when the sun did set, they who? <laughs> See, look at y'all. You're the they. They brought unto him all that, that were diseased and were possessed with devils. You know what I'd like for you to do? I double dog dare you to go find some possessed people and some sick people and bring them up in here. I double dog dare you. With, how, can you make that any word? Like a cherry on top. Amen. You know, most of the time when we see demon possessed people and sick people, we're like, hey, yeah. Hope you're getting better. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> From afar. They didn't. They brought him in. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, you just had two missionaries that just encouraged you about some of the heart of what God is about reaching people. I'm asking you to be a part of that. And all the city was gathered together at the door. Next verse. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils. Now all of a sudden they're seeing crazy amounts of demons. It's amazing how sick people and demon-possessed people just seem to be drawn to the light. Like moths to a light. Amen. You've got the light. 
And he suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Dear Lord, I wished we knew Jesus the way the devils and the demons did. We'd be drawn to him as well. And in the morning, arising up a great while before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. He was very intimate with the Lord. And Simon, who's Peter, and they that were with him, followed after him. They followed him where he went. When he went to pray, they went after him. Why? Because the next verse says that when they found him, they said unto him, let me tell you one of the most important verses in this chapter, all Men, seek you. All men seek you. I want this to go deep into your heart. All men are seeking him. Not the people I witness to. They say they don't want nothing to do with him. Listen to me. The heart of all mankind is seeking their creator. You just might need to help them see it. All. All. You know what all means in the Greek? All of mankind is seeking Jesus. All I'm asking you to do is give them what they need. Just give them what they need. If you, see, if you were in a desert and you've seen a person lying in a desert and they were about to die. All they needed was a drink. And you had a water truck. And you said, hope you get what you need and drive by. Listen to folks that you know that don't know Jesus. They're dying in a desert. They might be on their last breath. And you've got a river of living water that is flowing out of the core of who you are. Give them a drink. Jesus said, behold the fields, they are white and ripe unto harvest. In other words, everybody's ready to be harvested. We just need folks that will go and harvest them. Say, I'm one of the they. Amen. And he said unto them, let's go into the next town that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And the next verse says, and Jesus went to the churches. Why? Because they were going to gather all the people in the churches, and Jesus was going to show up. You bring the people in here, Jesus will show up. Amen? Okay, now we have some, uh, some equipping for you, because I'm, I don't want to see this beautiful pattern anymore. Amen? I want to see a big fat or a little skinny butt where this pattern once was. Amen? So we have equipment. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 that God gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saint, saints, for the work of the ministry. Say, I am a saint. I'm, I'm going to make you say this twice because a lot of people don't believe that. You're not going to become a saint. Say, I am a saint. And so my job is to equip you. So everyone right now is getting some equipment. In your equipment, in your, your army backpack, amen. Your, I'm sorry, your rucksack. I still got my towel. Works good, too. Craig gave me an army towel. And it's, it was unique to use for the first time. It was like a chamois. And I'm not a car. I mean, I know I look slick. And fast, (laughs) but I'm not a car. In your rucksack, in your equipping, you're going to find some really cool things. For example, a a book that says why it's important that you're part of what Jesus ministered at, the synagogue. But in addition to that, you're going to find uh, four business card looking doodads. And if you'll look at your business cards for a moment, does anyone have one out? I can. You're, okay, open up your present. <laughs> I don't know what y'all are waiting for. Probably waiting for me, the leader. In your 
equipment, your rucksack, you're going to find a business card that says, be my guest. And it says, to church and lunch is on me. Talk about equipping. That's good equipment right there. And then if you open it up, you'll see that it gives the address and the time. And over on the right-hand side, it says, when you attend Beloved Church, on a Sunday morning, you'll receive a voucher for Subway for a free six-inch sandwich. This is for real. We're going to invite people to partake of the bread of life and then to partake of the bread of Subway. <laughs> this is to equip you so that you have, um, you have a confidence and a boldness to approach someone. Obviously, there's a map on the back that shows you where the church and where Subway is. Now, here's the thing. You also have another uh, little flyer in there that gives you some stats. Here's some of the facts. 67% of Americans say that a personal invitation from a family member would be very or somewhat affected in them visiting the church. 67% of the people in your family are waiting for you. 63% of Americans are very or somewhat willing to receive information about a local congregation from a family member. 63% of Americans say personal invitation would be very or somewhat effective in getting them to visit. 56% say they are somewhat willing to receive information about a local congregation from a friend or a neighbor. It means you can go next door. I've been helping some political campaigns lately. You know how political campaigns get people to vote for them? Has anybody ever had a politician knock on your door? Yeah, I've done that. Has anybody ever had a politician call them? You know, here's the amazing thing. Some of these politicians believe so much that they should be elected to a position that they are willing to go to your house, knock on your door, and call your phone. And we don't believe in Jesus that much. If Jesus was running for office, I don't know if we'd be on his campaign team. Amen. Uh, one of the things I want to say is that we think that if you were going to ask someone, and I want you to look at those stats later, if you were to ask someone, what's the thing that's going to get people in a church? You know, most people are going to say, outreach. Let's go reach out. Outreach is going to do it. You know, only 3% of the people that currently attend church got there from outreach? Three. So it's not that it's not important. I'm saying this, 70%, 70% of all Christians in church today got there because a friend or a family member brought them. Heaven is going to be populated by people that you bring there. Amen. You are going to be the difference in someone's eternity. You're going to be the difference in whether we see purple or someone's smiling face as they're having an encounter with Jesus. If you're bold enough to talk to folks about your sports team, about your job, about your family, you can whip out a picture of your kids. Don't you think Jesus is at least as important as your sports team? Maybe equal? Maybe a little more, hopefully? So we're equipping you. I'm going to buy the lunch. If i got to buy it out of my pocket, I will. We're going to buy folks Subway sandwiches just so you can go and sit down with them and say, Hey, what would you think? I don't know. In the middle of it, I got all teary-eyed. Well, let me talk to you about that. And you're going to get to change somebody's eternity. Say, I'm a they. And I'm equipped. All right. So now you can do it. All right. So please rise up to your feet. I'm going to pronounce a blessing over you. You've been, you've been filled. You've been encouraged, you've been equipped. This is, this is a good day to be in church. Amen?
Amen. You experienced Jesus. You experienced his gifts. And if there's anything else you need, we're, gonna, we're willing to pray for you. I know there's some folks that need some healing, and we're going to heal some folks right in here with Jesus Christ and his love. Amen. So if you want to witness a miracle, stick around. That would be cool too. All right, so hold out your heart by holding out your hands. You are a receiver. The Father wants to bless you. He wants to speak words of empowerment over you, words that are filled with the anointing power of God. These words will accomplish what they are sent to do if you receive them. Beloved, that means the ones that are greatly loved. Beloved, I pray, I proclaim, and I declare over you that you are prospering and you are in divine health to the degree that your soul is prospering. Above all things, the Father desires this to be in your life. I proclaim this, I bless you in Jesus' name. And if you receive that, close your hands and say, it's mine. All right, you're blessed. Amen. Right, you're welcome to go downstairs and join our party. Or you're welcome to stay up here and watch a miracle.